Thank you for joining us today. We love to hear your testimony about how God is using destiny in your life. You can visit our website, destinychurchjacksonville.com and click on the testimony link. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online. Now, get ready to receive a word from God. Well, welcome to week two of our series called Transformed. I'm glad the three people are excited about it. Listen, if you're just joining us, um, we've been looking at seven key areas in our life in which we believe that God wants to bring about transformation. Last week, we talked about being transformed in our spiritual health. Today, we're going to be talking about being transformed in our physical health. And I've got to tell you that as I was preparing for this message, that I felt conviction (laughs) that I've never taught this before. Because as I started diving into what God had to say about our physical health, I realized this is a message that the body of Christ needs to hear. And the reason why is because many believers aren't carrying out their full potential. And it isn't because they're not spiritually healthy, but it's because they're not physically healthy. I want to start out. We're reading a scripture from the book of 3 John, chapter 1. Uh, You can follow along, by the way, in your new Destiny Church app. If you've not downloaded it yet, why have you not downloaded it yet? We're going to look at 3 John, chapter 1, verse 2. And the scripture starts by saying, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. God's word says that he wants us physically healthy just as we are spiritually healthy. Today we're going to dive into his word and we're going to look at why. And I want to talk about the why rather than the how because I think that most of us already know what's necessary to be physically healthy, right? I mean, it's not rocket science. You've got to eat the right foods, with the right portions, Uh, you've got to make sure that you get exercise, get plenty of sleep, lower your stress level. I mean, we all know this, right? I mean, nothing new here. And so I want us to focus on the motivation for why we should strive to become healthy and to stay healthy. And let me just start out by, by making a disclaimer. It's not just so that you can look good or feel good, or people can compliment you. The, the purpose of this message isn't so you can be fit, fine, and fabulous, all right? That, that's what we're talking about. There's a much more, and somebody says, that's all right, though, isn't it? Well, there's a much more important reason than that to be healthy, all right? And it has eternal implications. You see, the problem with many Christians is that even if God told them what it was that he wanted them to do with their lives, they wouldn't have the energy to do it. They're limited on what they can do because they're not physically healthy. Now, I'm going to throw out another disclaimer here and say that I know, and certainly God knows, that there are some health conditions that are beyond our control. That's not what we're talking about today. Everyone, did everyone just hear me on that? There are some health conditions that you cannot control. That's not what I am talking about. All right, we're talking about the part of our physical health that we do have the ability to do something about. And so on that note, let me just start by saying God wants you to take care of your body. Not just because that's where we live, but because that's where he lives. You see, the Bible teaches us that he lives in us, that he works through us. And anything that God wants to do through your life, he's going to do through your physical body. And so if we're unhealthy and if we don't have the energy to do what he's called us to do, then we create a limitation on our life. Now, if you disagree with this, make sure that you listen to the whole sermon here before you tune me out. Because God has some very specific and direct things that he has to say about our physical health. 
And I know that this may very well be a completely different motivation than you've ever heard before for being fit and healthy. But you know, I can't think of any greater motivator than what God has to say about our physical health. And so we're going to dive into God's word and see what he has to say about the importance of our physical uh, body and our health. And I think that you're going to see that taking care of your physical health is an act of spiritual discipline. Just like last week when we talked about our spiritual health, there are habits that we have to develop in order to get healthy. But in order to do that, I've found that you've got to have the right motivation. Now, can I just tell you that this message has been 15 years in the making for me. And the reason why is because I I was an athlete in school. I was a, a personal trainer in college. And during my 20s, I was in in better physical condition and shape than almost all of my peers. But then life got busy. Having three kids has a way of causing that to happen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And then, see, my issue wasn't that I didn't know what to do, right? I used to train others what to do. I even used to do the right things. But then I lost my motivation. And I suspect that that's true of a lot of you here this morning. And so I want to share with you some motivators. And really, they're more than just motivators. They're truth. And because they're truth, I pray that they will set up firm as conviction in your heart. Now, before we dive into these truths or these motivators, I want to first read to you a few passages from uh, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, Paul starts by saying, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me. In other words, I've got the freedom to do whatever I want, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, what's God saying here? God's saying that there are some things in our life that they're not necessarily wrong. They're just not beneficial. They're not helpful. And he's saying that your life is too short to waste it on things that are not beneficial or on things that are not going to propel you forward toward your destiny. Paul then goes on to say, I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, he was saying, I'm not going to allow anything to dominate my life because whatever dominates your life is your God. Paul said, I'm not going to be addicted to anything. I'm not going to be mastered by anything. You see, he's laying out an example for us on how we should live our lives. And I think that his point needs to be considered well by the church, especially in our generation, because all too often we end up asking the wrong questions. We ask questions like, what can I do and still be okay? Like, what is permissible for me as a Christian? But Paul says, don't ask what is permissible, ask what's beneficial. Don't ask what can you do, ask what should you do. Say amen so it sounds like I'm not talking to you. (laughs) Paul goes on to say in verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. But how was Jesus raised from the dead? He was raised physically. And how's God going to raise us? He's going to physically raise our body as well. The scripture goes on to say in verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Then in verse 19 and 20, it says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Now, the passage that we just read here from 1 Corinthians 6, it teaches us six radically countercultural things about your body. Things that you need to know in order to be transformed in this key area of your life, your physical health. Now, I want you to write these down. Number one is this, is that my body is God's property. In other words, it belongs to him. Now, that concept is counterculture 
Because society has taught us that our bodies are our own and that we can do with them whatever we want. Well, that's not what God says. God says that he owns our bodies. They're just on loan to us. We don't own it because we didn't make it. Now, I think we understand this concept in other areas of our life, the concept of stewardship and and taking care of what's been given to us. Like we understand that the gifts and the talents that we've been given, that we're to be good stewards of them. We understand this uh, when we talk about the children that God has given us and us being good stewards of them uh, and and how that God has called us to be good stewards of our, our finances and good stewards of our time. But what about our bodies? How well are we doing as stewarding them? You see, everything that we have in life is on loan from God, and it should be treated with the understanding that it's all his. He owns it. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14 says, you created every part of me. You put me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. See, church, God made us, therefore we belong to him. But not only in making us, but in everything that God makes, he has a purpose. And so it is with our physical bodies. They have a God-ordained purpose. See, I think a lot of Christians, they just want to compartmentalize their lives and, and separate their spiritual health, thinking that that's the only thing that matters. And that what we do with our bodies really isn't that big of a deal. Well, God says that it is is a big deal. Both your spiritual and your physical health matter to God, which leads us to the second truth that the Bible teaches, and it says this in 1 Corinthians 6, God expects me to manage my body. That's point number two. I don't know if you've ever considered this, but when we stand before God and we give an account of everything that he's given us, do you know that this includes our bodies as well? Everything that God gives us, we're accountable for. As a matter of fact, when you look across the scripture, there's one place that Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, that on the day of judgment, that people will give account for every careless word they speak. You see, God cares about every single part of our life, and will give an account for every single part of our life. See, I think this is what the scripture goes on to say when it says that in every part, God has also made provision. And that's the good news, is that with everything that God has called us to, he's also made provision. 2 Peter 1.3 says it this way, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So when God has called you to live this godly life, he has given you everything that you live to be able to, or everything you need in order to be able to live it. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God has told us how we're to live, and then he's given us the power to be able to pull it off. Can you, are you hearing me this morning? So we're without excuse. God has told us how to live, and he has given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us his divine power to be able to pull it off. That's why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, I will not be mastered by anything. He's saying, I'm responsible for the decisions that I make over my health and my body, and I'm not going to allow anything to dominate my life. Not food, not drink, not sex, not sleep, not anything. See, he was communicating the truth that we are responsible for our bodies, and we can't blame anything or anyone else if we mistreat them. Friends, I've shared this with you before, but life is preparation for eternity. And I'm convinced that many of the things we've been entrusted with are simply a test. A test to see what we can further be entrusted with. Not only in this life, watch this, but also in eternity. Life is a test. And one day we will stand before God and he will ask what we've done with all that he's given us. And included in that will be what we did with the body that he gave us. 
Now, here's the third thing that the Bible teaches about your body. It says, my body will be resurrected after I die. Don't everyone all shout at once. Come on, thank God I don't have to keep this thing for all of eternity, right? Church, you're going to get a new version of yourself. That is reason to shout. You're going to get a version 2.0 of you. Right now, you're just living in version 1.0. And watch this. The Bible teaches this. See, some people, I think, just believe that when we go into heaven, we're just going to be floating around like a spirit or something. But the Bible teaches that we will have a new body. We read it earlier, 1 Corinthians 6, 14 says, By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will also raise us. Now, what will that look like? Well, none of us know for certain, but the scripture does give us an indication that the old body will become a new body, but it will still be your body. There will be continuity. Paul said, It is sown a perishable body, but is raised an imperishable body. Paul compares the resurrection of the body to the growth of a plant from a seed. The plant that results from the seed is definitely better than the seed, just as our resurrection bodies will be better than the ones that we have now. But there's also real continuity between the seed and the plant because they're the same organism. Just like the body that we have now becomes our resurrected body. See, the body that we have now, which is mortal, will become immortal. As a matter of fact, did you know that people will recognize you in heaven? Say, Pastor, how is that even possible? Well, all things are possible to him who believes. And with God, all things are possible. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you or I could ever ask or imagine. You see, the resurrection is not described in terms of a totally new creation, but in terms of a change of the old creation. And it doesn't matter if the body is decayed or cremated. God said that he's going to resurrect it. Hey, the God that created you is certainly able to recreate you. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 says suddenly, hmm, like the blink of an eye, At the last trumpet, when it shall sound. And the dead shall rise without corruption. And we shall be, here it is, transformed. Come on, say transformed. There's our series title. And watch this. This word, it literally means to exchange one thing for another. To cause one to cease and for another to take its place. And church, here's an important piece of theology to know. Christ's resurrection is the pattern of our resurrection. Therefore, we'll be raised in a physical body just as he was. Philippians 3 verse 20 and 21 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Now, that's one of those verses that you could just chew on all day long and just barely but scratch the surface of all that's being said there. Let me give you one more scripture before we move on to the next point. Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Church, you know what stands out to me on that last scripture right there? Is that there is more power inside of us than we could ever possibly imagine or realize. But we'll get to that whenever we hit point number five. Let's first hit point number four. Point number four. Is my body is connected to the body of Christ. And maybe you've never considered this before, but the Bible actually teaches that our body is connected to the body of Christ. Not just our soul, not just our spirit, but also our body. That's what 1 Corinthians 6.15 says. It says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? 
See, this is why God cares about how we treat our body. Because it's connected to his body, the body of Christ. Jesus gave his body for you. And in return, he wants you to honor him with your body. You know, of all people, Christians should care more about their physical health and how we use our bodies more than anybody else. Because how you treat your body is a reflection on the body of Christ. It's a testimony to the world. Now, I'm not talking about overindulgence, beauty products, and that everyone should strive to be like a model or a a bodybuilder all buff and ripped and stuff. Like, people can go overboard with that in their physical bodies to the point to where it becomes vanity. But that's not what we're talking about here. Are you with me? I'm simply talking about us making the most of what we've been given. Honor God with the body that you've been given and represent him well by being as healthy as you possibly can. Now, here's the fifth radical truth that the Bible teaches about our body. The Holy Spirit lives in my body. Somebody needs to hear that right now. Somebody needs to hear that. Because you've been abusing your body, you've been considering to abuse your body, and you need to know that the Spirit of God lives inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. The scripture teaches us that God's spirit takes up residence on the inside of us once we put our faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this point alone convicts me and the things that I allow myself to be subjected to, my body to be subjected to, and the things that I won't allow it to be subjected to. Not only that, but watch this. God actually has a warning for when we don't manage our bodies as we should. Did you know that? But let me tell you what it says. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And Paul is saying what he said in 1 Corinthians 6 that we just read. He's reiterating it, but then he adds something to it. He says, do you not know that you're God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Same thing we just read in 1 Corinthians 6. But then he goes on to say this. Now, listen to this, church. This isn't pastor's words. This is God's words. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Follow with me on this. All throughout Scripture... God has always had a dwelling place here on the earth. First, he dwelled in the tabernacle. That was the tent that was built based on the specifications that were given to Moses. The tabernacle then became God's dwelling place here on earth. Then later on, God gave David instructions on building the temple in Jerusalem, which was different from the tabernacle. That was a temple that was built of stone. Then that became his dwelling place. But where does God dwell today? In you, in me. Church, I think that we should make it a daily habit to remind ourselves that we are God's temple. Let me just use this illustration here if I could. None of you would go into a church building with a bat and start destroying things or take spray paint and start vandalizing it. Why? Because you would never do that to a place that was dedicated to the worship of God. Yet we do this all the time with our physical bodies. And I promise you that your body is far more valuable to God than any building. Say, Pastor, what do you mean by us destroying our bodies? I'm talking about the things that the scripture said that we're to keep our life free from. Like keeping our bodies free from addiction. I don't care if I get a lot of amens. I know I'm preaching truth, so I'm going to preach it boldly. Free from abuse. Free from sexual immorality in the Bible. Tells us what sexual immorality is. Free from gluttony or overeating, just to name a few. But watch this. Every time we do any of these things and the many other things that the Bible teaches us, we're vandalizing the temple of God. 
By the way, can I just say this is one of the many reasons that we need to know what God's word has to say about how we treat our bodies. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, ignorance is not an excuse. I actually had someone say to me once, they said, well, pastor, I don't want to read the Bible because if I read it, then I'm going to be accountable for what I know. <laughs> That's kind of like saying, I don't want to know what the speed limit is. That way I won't get a ticket. Yeah, that doesn't work in the world, and guess what? It doesn't work with God either. The scripture says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Now, what does it mean when it says that God will destroy him? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be a good teacher and say, find the answer out to that for yourself. I'm going to tell you why, because if I gave you the answer, some of you would say, well, I just don't agree with that anyway. So, all right, that's fine. You go research it out, because that is written like that in your Bible, I promise. You research it out, and you come to a conclusion on what it means when it says, if anyone destroys God's temple. Now, don't be thinking that he's talking about what got destroyed almost 2,000 years ago, because he clarifies that later. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, ready, comma, and you are that temple. I'll tell you this, it doesn't take rocket science to land on a conclusion. But what it should do is cause us to reconsider how we're managing his temple, your body. The sixth and the final radical truth that the Bible teaches is that Jesus bought my body on the cross. You see, Jesus didn't just pay for your soul when he died on the cross. He paid for your body as well. That's what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says. It says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. What's the scripture saying? It's saying, Jesus paid for the real estate called your body. And you know, this verse here, I believe it speaks volumes of God's love towards us. And I just want to say that if you ever doubt how God sees you, if you ever doubt God's love for you, you need look no further than the cross. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Follow with me now. Jesus chose to be beaten. You hear me? No one took his life from him. He offered it as a sacrifice. He offered his body to receive the 39 lashes of the cat and nine tails, which if you don't know what that is, it's a whip with nine strips of leather, often containing weighted balls and pieces of bone in order to lacerate and inflict maximum damage. The church historian Eusebius of Caesarea, he recounts with vivid and, and horrible detail a scene of scourging. In his writings, he, he said, for they say that the bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges, even to the innermost veins and arteries so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view. You see, that whipping, that beating, it would often just leave a person, a lot of times they would die during the scourging. But the beating would leave a victim bloody and weak and in unimaginable pain and near to the point of death, some even dying. It's no doubt that it was this weakness which prevented Jesus from being able to carry his cross all the way up to Golgotha. And then the crucifixion itself is one of the most agonizing, torturous deaths that you could ever possibly imagine. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because you need to know that Jesus died for your whole person. He died for your spirit. He died for your soul, and he died for your body. That's why God's word teaches us to honor him with our body. 
just exactly how do we do that? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 12 and verse 1. He said, I urge you, brothers. One of the things about the text, I love to do this when I'm reading the scripture because oftentimes when we read text, it's hard for us to pick up tone in text. It's the reason I'm not a big texter. I like to hear people's voice and hear their vocal inflection. But I like to read the scripture sometimes. I don't know, this is just me. And I like to think of the inflection that's probably being said here. And so just allow me a little bit of liberty here, if you will. But I think that when Paul wrote this, he wasn't just saying, I urge you. I think he's saying, I urge you. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. And I think when he said in view of God's mercy, he was thinking about the scene that I just described to you of the beating. And the cross. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. See, it's pleasing to God when we offer our bodies to him. He goes on to say, this is your spiritual act of worship. Here's what we have to be mindful of. I I heard a preacher once say this is that the problem with the living sacrifice is that it can crawl off the altar. You see, we've got to daily choose, daily choose to offer our bodies to God. We've got to make it a habit. Paul ends that verse with saying, this is your spiritual act of worship. Friends, offering our bodies to God is worship. The question is, who are you offering your body to? Are you primarily offering it to someone else, something else? Perhaps you're offering it to yourself. Well, the scripture teaches that how we handle our bodies tells us something about who or what we worship. As I said at the beginning of my message, these thoughts are radical thoughts in our generation, and they're they're counter cultural in that our society says that we can do whatever we want with our bodies. I mean, there are bodies, so I can do with my body whatever I want. And friends, that's the opposite of what God says. He says that taking care of our physical bodies and keeping them free from the things that his word says to keep them free from, that doing that is an act of worship to God. You see, managing your physical health is a spiritual discipline. It's a habit that you have to develop. Now, if you remember in last week's message, I said that every promise has a premise. Do you remember that? Well, there are promises and premises in regards to how we manage our bodies. There are blessings that God said that are ours, but we've got to do things the way that God said to do them. We've got to do them his way. Now, I'm going to bring today's lesson to a close by telling you a story, it's from the book of John. In John chapter 5, Jesus had came across a man who had been sick for 38 years. And Jesus went up to the man, and he asked him a very important question. In John chapter 5 and verse 6, he asked, Do you want to get well? Now I want you to think about that question just for a moment. Here's a man who had been sick, For almost four decades, and the first thing that Jesus asks him is if he wants to get well. It seems like a a strange question to ask because, after all, if if you know the story, the man was at the pool of Bethesda. This is a place where it was said that angels would come and that they would stir the waters, and that if someone would get into the waters, be the first to get into the waters, once the angels stirred it, the angels would come from time to time, it said, would come for a season, that they would be healed of their afflictions. And so why did Jesus ask this man if he wanted to get well? You see, I think that Jesus wasn't just asking do you want to get well, but more like, do you really want to get well? Or are you content to stay in the sick body that you've got? And I think that's the same question that Jesus wants to ask you today. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get healthy? And a year from today, do you want to be in better physical health than you are today? Or are you going to continue 
to keep living an unhealthy lifestyle. Friends, I gotta tell you, this message has been born from God dealing with me about my own health. You see, I can only take the message of the good news as far as this temple can carry it. It was just a couple of months ago that I was trekking through the mountains of Thailand that it became real apparent to me (laughs) that I was limited on what I could do. And the reason why was because I had not been taking care of my physical body the way that I should. And then the thought hit me. God may want me to go and to reach someone, but I may not get the chance because my body can't go much further. And when that thought hit me, church, that lit a fire in my furnace. Because I don't want to miss God because of something that I have mismanaged in my life. Are you hearing me? Now, church, if you're here and you're not physically healthy, please hear this. This message is not to condemn. If that's what you've heard today, you've heard the wrong message. This message is not a message to condemn. This is simply a call to change. It's a call to be transformed to exchange the way that you've been doing things. We can't do nothing about the past, but you can do something about today and tomorrow and your future. It's us exchanging our old way of doing things and exchanging them for a new, healthy way of doing it. So I want to end today's lesson, today's message, with a call to action. I want to ask you, what's one thing that you can do? Just one. What's one step that you can take toward becoming a healthier person? For those of you that are using this message in your study group, you can sit with one another in your group and discuss what that one thing is that you will do. Not something that you can do, but something that you will do in order to become a more physically healthy person and then hold one another accountable. And by the way, accountability isn't just calling one another out, but it's us calling one another up. Are you with me? Church, I want you to remember that God wants us to be as healthy physically as we are spiritually because you cannot accomplish all that he wants to do in and through your life if you're not. Don't allow yourself to be limited by overlooking this key area of your life. Let's choose to be transformed in our physical health. Amen? Amen. Come on, stand to your feet with me. Join me in prayer. Now, before we pray, I called Laurie last night at about 9.30. I had an old worship hymn that was stirring in my spirit that I thought that was really appropriate for what we're talking about today. And so I want us to sing these words. If you don't know it, you'll see the words on the screen, but we're going to sing these words as a declaration that we want God to be glorified in every area of our life. Come on, church, let's sing.
Come on, sing that last verse one more time in this house. Come on, sing. Oh, in this house, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in this house, Lord, be glorified today. Come on, join me in prayer. Lord, be glorified in this house. In this oikos, in this temple, oh God, and in every part of our lives. God, may we bring you glory in everything that we do. Lord, for it's your name, it's your renown that's the desire of our hearts, Jesus. And may this day mark the day of new beginnings. May this day be known as a day of transformation for many people's lives that are here. And may this day be the day that we fix our eyes toward heaven and never look back. In Jesus' name.